I want to start out today by telling you guys a story about something that happened to me uh, back in November. And uh, I had a meeting at Denny's, because that's the best place to have meetings, because there's food, and I like that. And so I had this meeting at Denny's, and I was leaving the meeting, and I had a bunch of stuff to do, a big, long to-do list. And as I pulled out uh, into traffic, uh, there was a ton of it, a ton of it. So I carefully merged into traffic and was going along, and then I was like, oh, no, I need to get into the left lane, and I'm in the right lane. So I looked over into my blind spot, because that's what all of you should do if you guys are too young to drive. You should look into your blind spot. But apparently I looked there too long because when I was looking backwards, I happened to crash while I was going forwards. Uh, and what happened was, while I was looking at my blind spot, the person in front of me stopped very abruptly and I just smashed my car into them and totaled it completely. And I'm curious uh, why you guys think that happened. What, what was I doing uh, that caused me to crash my car? Yeah, I was looking completely in the wrong place, right? I was looking backward when I was driving forward. And like I said, it's good to check your blind spot, but uh, maybe not in the way that I was doing it. And this accident happened because I was distracted. I was thinking, man, I got to make that turn up there. So let me look over here. And I didn't notice that there was a Jeep in front of me uh, that had stopped. And so what happened is I crashed my car into them and, you know, so that was bad. And then I got out of the car and I went up there and there was like crying babies. So that was really bad. And then the guy steps out of the passenger seat and he's like, I just came from the dentist. And he's like, my face, because it hurt really bad. And then, you know, the mom is getting out and she's worried. Oh, no, you like messed up the fillings and the babies back here are crying. And it was you know, kind of a high pressure, worrisome situation. Not good at all. Everyone ended up being okay, which is great, um, but it was not a good situation. And really, all I had to do was drive correctly, and I could have avoided it. But what happened is I got distracted. I was focused on the wrong thing. And I hope none of you guys have ever crashed a car, and I hope that you never do. It's, it seems like it's fun when you see it in movies and stuff, but it's not. It's not fun at all. And, uh, but I think that you guys probably can relate to looking at the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're a guy, uh, you can relate to this. Have you ever been hanging out with people watching like a sports game? Girls, this can apply to you too. Watching a sports game or something and you turn away, you're like, man, I'm just gonna grab a drink or go to the bathroom or you know, whatever. And, so, and then all of a sudden, just as you turn around, everyone's like, whoa, that was awesome. And you turn around and you're like, what, what? And they're like, oh, you missed it when there was this great catch or the whatever that happened when you were turned around. Has that ever happened to any of you guys? Yes, no, maybe. I mean, I know it's early in the morning, but you guys got to give me something, you know, back. You know, even if, if it's a no, you can be like, no. <laughs> Not really, that'd be distracting. But, you know, something. But yeah, when you turn around and you, and you miss something that's important because you are looking uh, at the wrong thing at the wrong time. And it's sad when we miss something amazing because we're looking in the wrong direction. And this absolutely applies to our spiritual lives as well as well. When we focus our minds on the wrong things, we can miss out on the best things. And that's tragic. So let me just read the beginning of Colossians chapter 3. It says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. All right, someone hit me with this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Don't worry about, don't spend all your attention and your passions on things of this world because we have something better, right? Like you said. Heaven, something that is lasting, something that is meaningful. Ultimately, we have a new life in Christ if we love him. And that changes everything. And it changes our focus. It's a big part of, of who we are and what we do is based on what we focus on. You know, uh, you guys can have all the musical talent in the world, but uh, Mr. Lusk will tell you if you don't practice, it doesn't pay off, right? You could, if, you don't, if we don't focus on something... If we don't put our attention on something, then there's no result from it. That, so this means that, that Jesus and the life that we can have with him, the life that doesn't end, 
We can have all that instead of worrying so much about the life here on earth um, and everything here just fades away. I mean, it's kind of depressing to think about, but every part of life fades away. There is nothing that you have, no piece of clothing that you own that will last forever. Nobody's life here living on earth uh, will last forever. We have eternity with God, but it doesn't last forever. That's absolutely true, that our focus is not on the things here on earth, but on the things that will last forever. And, and just, you know, this makes sense, right? If you have a choice, should I focus on something that will last forever or something that will last five minutes, what do you choose? Something that's going to last forever, right? Right? Yeah, it's, it's not a hard choice. It's like this. If I said, would you like $100 or $1, you can only pick one. How many of you guys are going for the one? Nobody, right? Because we want the thing that, that means more, and eternity means more than this short, passing life that we have here on earth and the things that motivate us here. Um, so Christ uh, is now what our lives are all about, and the reality is, what it says in this passage, is he is coming back. And when he does, we want to be close to him. We want to be on his side. We want to know him well. We want to be ready, and we want to hear him say, good job. Right? I know that I do. And so what it's saying is that we need to set our sights on the realities of heaven, that we shouldn't be so concerned, uh, that we should be so concerned with getting to where Christ is because we love him. Like, our love for him should just motivate everything. Uh, that God says that we need to focus on heaven and not the things of, of earth. And this plays out in Romans chapter 1. The Bible says that, uh, that what happens there is, is often we trade uh, our creator and his glory for created things. We trade something that is majestic and, and amazing and awesome. You got that, Mark? All right. And awesome. That one too? Okay, um, things that are just so beyond incredible for things that don't really mean anything. We trade the creator for the creation. And, and one guy explained it to me like this. It's like if God's glory and his incredible nature is like a diamond. Ladies, I, I've seen the commercials. You guys seen the commercials? All the every kiss begins with K. Apparently diamonds are valuable. Not only are they worth a lot of money, but they're worth a lot of love. Okay, so diamonds are very valuable. And if you have a diamond, uh, this exchange that we make, trading the creator for the created, is like taking a diamond to a pawn shop and trading it in for a penny. Okay, There's, there is absolutely nothing that's more foolish than that. To take something that's valuable and significant, not only in cost, but in, in worth. You know, someone taking and trading in their wedding ring. This represents, you know, when people get married, you know, this ring represents love. You know, it represents commitment. It represents a meaningful and lasting relationship. And for someone to take that and say, you know, I'll just trade all of this, the monetary value of it, but also the significance of it in my life and just, you know, pawn it off for a penny. Doesn't that seem crazy? Does that seem crazy to you guys? You got to be awake. You got to... And that's absolutely what we do. You know, we do that. We trade God's glory, which is so significant, so incredible, so lasting, for something that doesn't mean anything. But it, this continues on, and, and this passage tells us how this plays out in our life. It says that we have died to this life, and our real life is now hidden with Christ in God. And you guys might be thinking, well, I don't feel like I've died. Like... Last night when I was about to go to bed, I felt like I was about to die. But, you know, right now, I don't feel like I've died. I feel like I'm pretty alive. I'm pretty with it. I'm confused about what's going on here. And the basic idea is that when we choose to follow Jesus, our life changes. Our identity changes. How many of you guys have ever baked a cake? How many of you guys have ever watched Food Network and seen a cake baked? Mmm. I like cake. I like food, and cake is food, so I like cake. And uh, when I think about how cake is made, there's a bunch of things that go in, right? You got your eggs and flour, potentially gluten-free for some of you guys, and uh, sugar, maybe some coloring, and a bunch of other things that you put in this cake so that you can get it all Paula Deaned out. And, uh, and you put it all together, and you, know, you make it, and you put it in the oven, come out, 
get it all frosted and it's looking nice. And can you imagine you made this cake and you bring it in, you're having a party or something and everyone goes, oh man, look at that. It looks good. Kelly just brought out that delicious pile of sweet, eggy sugar flour. Does anyone say that? <laughs> no, they're like, man, look at that cake, right? Kelly, although he looks like he wouldn't be able to cook, because he really can't, uh, put together this, this cake, right? No one, no one talks about the ingredients in the cake. No one goes, man, the eggs in that cake were delicious. <laughs> the sugar in that cake was right on. No, they just said, man, that cake was good. The identity of the ingredients completely changed. The identity of the ingredients completely changed. And that's what being changed and having a new life in Christ, being, being dead to ourselves and now alive in our real life with Christ is all about, that our identity changes. Because our life is not about us anymore. It's about something bigger. Just like the flower's life isn't about just being flower anymore, it's about being something better, something more important. It's about cake. Well, for us, when we have Christ, our life isn't about us because that's minuscule. We are nothing. You know, the Bible is, is so clear that we just pass through. We are like a vapor, a wisp of smoke, here and gone. A flower that blooms and then withers. But God and the things of God last forever. And what this says is that our real life, when it gets tethered to him, when we get mixed up in his business, when he gives us a new identity, everything changes. And we go from being minuscule to eternal. Not because we are great, but because God is great. And he completely transforms who we are. And we find new purpose and new meaning in him and through him. So that's what this is talking about. And those are all good thoughts. But really, they won't matter too much if, if we don't apply them to our life, like we were talking about with scripture a little bit earlier. And you might be asking yourself, well, that sounds good. I like cake. But you know, I I don't know why I should focus on God and the things of heaven, because I kind of like the way that things are. And we have this struggle as Christians because we want to love God, but we also want to love other things. We want to love God and make him uh, the ruler of our life. And we like to sing these songs at Chehi and, you know, whatever, but we don't want to give up our other loves, you know. And when you really think about that, this halfway type Christianity, this both and, I will love God and other things, it's cheap. I mean, it is cheap. Uh, you guys know Mr. Raleigh? Sweet mustache. Okay. Imagine if Mr. Raleigh, and I know I can bring him up because he is not a shady individual. Imagine if Mr. Raleigh showed up yesterday and you hadn't met Mrs. Raleigh yet. And he's like, man, I, I, I love my wife so much. Let me show you a picture of my wife in my wallet because you guys with smartphones and stuff know that people don't carry phone, uh, pictures in their wallet anymore. They have them on their phones. But Mr. Raleigh, although he does have a smartphone, we're just going to assume he's from a different generation. So, he whips out his wallet and he shows a, a picture to you of his beautiful wife, Mrs. Raleigh, not the one with the, the creepy one that you are talking about last night, um, but a normal picture of Mrs. Raleigh and you say, man, um, you know, she's beautiful and then he's like, check this out too. And he pulls out another picture and he's like, this is, you know, this is my girlfriend. And then he pulls out another picture, and he's like, this is another lady I'm interested in. And he pulls out another picture, and he's like, you know, and here, here's one I, you know, I'm kind of working on, my next project lady. And, all right, okay, M Mr. Raleigh isn't doing that, so that's why I can bring him up and talk about this. Obviously, that's not the case. Uh, but if he did that, what would you guys think about his love for Mrs. Raleigh? Fake, cheap, weak, right? That would be... That would be the worst. That would be the worst. And think about, think about this. Think about if, if Mrs. Raleigh saw that. And he says, man, I love you. I love you with everything I am, except for what I'm giving to these other people. I love you so much, but I love them too. That's, that's cheap. That's weak. Like you guys shouted out a second ago, that's fake. It's, it's not good. And what we do uh, in our lives is so often we want to say, I love God but I also love these other things. And we ask this question, why should I focus on God and the things of heaven? Because I like things the way they are. I like knowing that I'm going to heaven, but I also like, you know, tasting what the world's got too. It's all about love. And it's, it's so simple, but, but love, when you really love somebody and you commit to somebody, it, like we were talking about before with Christ, it transforms you. You know, when you get married to somebody, 
you know, and you stand there at the altar, you know, and you exchange vows, you say, I am going to love this person forever, right? You say all these things in sickness and in health and the good times and the bad times, through the bad jokes and when you get ear hair, right? We talk about all this stuff and we say, I'm going to love you no matter what forever. And when you make that commitment, one of the things that is obvious is you're saying, I'm going to love you only. I'm going to love you most. And there's not going to be any other spouse in my life. There's not even going to be any room for them because I'm going to spend all of my love on you. Okay, that's what happens when, or hopefully that's what should happen when people get married. But with our relationship with Christ, we fade away from that so easily. But God loves us. And he loves us unconditionally. You know, when we think about the cross and what Jesus did for us, paying the price with his own life, with his blood, because he cares about us, knowing exactly who we are. That love should motivate us to love him back. You guys remember how this passage began? It said, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ. Because we have this new life, we are to set our, new, our, we are to set our eyes on Jesus and on heaven because he has given us new life. Okay, he's brought us back from the dead. Like we mentioned yesterday from Ephesians chapter 2, that we were dead in our sins. Dead. But he has given us new life because he died for us. And when we were nothing but selfish, God reached down to us to love us. And even though God knows everything about us, he still chose to make a place for us in heaven because he loves us. Do you get this kind of love? Like, he wants to be with you every second of every day for all time. That's how much he loves you. Like, I got some friends and stuff and people I like to hang out with, but... I don't know if there's anyone that I know that I'm like, man, I want to be with that person every minute of every day for all time. Like, have you ever hung out with, like, a good friend for, like, a week or two weeks or three weeks, and eventually you're like, okay, can I just get some alone time, please? Like, you know, you know have you guys ever felt like that? Yeah. yeah. And, and that happens. <laughs> but you know what God says? He says, I love you so much that I want to have heaven with you. And that doesn't just mean perfection. That means I want to be with you every minute of every day forever. That is some strong love. That is some huge love. And God has that for us. Knowing everything about us, he still has that love for us. You know, and our God saves anyone who chooses to believe in him and follow him. He says he will save us and give us new life that never ends. So why should we focus on him? Because he was focused on us. And why should we love him with the way that we live our lives? Because he loved us by giving up his life for us. And, you know, God loves us more than we can imagine. And he values the relationship with you enough that he said, there is nothing that will stop me from being with you. Not even yourself. And there's nowhere that you can run. You know, Psalm 139 says, there's nowhere we can go on earth to get away from God. Not a place. Because he always wants to be with us. He cares about us so much. And he even endured the cross. For you. For the relationship that he can have with you. So here's where it gets simple, but difficult. Make the choice to be with him. Make the choice to focus on him. Make the choice to love him back. Stop loving the things that this life has to offer that fade away, that are cheap and weak, and focus on the God who is anything but those things. The Bible says, and Jesus said, that no man can serve two masters. And he says you can't love God and, and money. But let me put it to you guys like this. You can't love God and popularity. And you can't love God and that one special relationship. He's above all of it. You can't love God and even music. If you make music the thing that runs your life, the thing, the underarching value that you get is from who you are in your music, you're, you are missing out. You can't love God and say that you really love achievement. Now, I'm not saying you can't enjoy these things, that you can't experience these things. I'm talking about really love them. I'm talking about find your identity in them. I'm talking about spend yourself on them because there's only one thing that's worth spending our lives on and that's the glory and honor of our God. 
And that's it. And all those other things are tools to do it. And so when you play your music, you play your music to glorify God. And then when you're in a relationship, you better be in a relationship to glorify God. And when you have friends, you should be motivating your friends to live lives that glorify God. And when you're in school, you should be learning so that you can live a life that glorifies God. And even when you play Frisbee later on today and lose to my team, you should do it in a way that glorifies God. That's the way it is. I mean, that is the way that is. And this is a constant battle for focusing on him because our focus drifts. And we start to, it is so easy for us to, to miss the point and to go from focusing on God and using these other things to focusing on the, these other things and using God. It's, it is so easy to make that transition. You know, I told you guys in the beginning about this story about how I crashed my car and I had another experience in the car about three weeks after this. That car was totaled. I got a new car, a new old car. Um, and so it was pretty sweet and I was driving along and I, I was going uh, to meet somebody and, you know, just dun -dun, minding my own business and a spider whoop, lowered itself down right in front of my face while I was driving the car. Uh, down the road. And it was frightening. It was scary. If you guys, like, I'm sure if other people looked into my car and saw what I was doing, they would have thought I was insane. I mean, and I'm not talking about like a little baby spider. I'm like talking like a big old honking spider coming down, in, like right in front of me. And then I lost it. It went down somewhere and I couldn't find it. I'm like, is it on, is it on me? Is it going down my pants? And what's, what is happening here? You know, so I'm, you know, and I arrived at my destination and I opened the door and I'm like, ah! You know, I jumped out of the car and, uh, and I didn't even remember how I got there. <laughs> All I remembered is that there is a spider somewhere, and I still haven't found it. Um, so, scary. Maybe it has like a nest in there, and soon they're plotting against me. And, no. Um, I never found it. But the, what I realized is I did it again. I had just paid huge consequences for crashing my car. It was a huge inconvenience. I had to deal with my insurance company. I had to go through all the trouble of trying to find a new car uh, and you know, work all these things out, get where I needed to, to go without um, being able to get where I needed to go. And all these things, all this inconvenience that happened because I wasn't focused on the right things and three weeks later, I did it again. A Little bit different circumstances, but I, I lost my focus again. And the reality is that this is a constant battle for us to continue to have our focus on God. To be completely set on the things that he has for us. Because you can be on it one minute and then something, a spider drops down and you're like, what? And, and that's, that happens. And in life it might not be a spider, but there will be things that come your way that turn your attention away from him. If you are not set, if you are not set on following him, on focusing on him, on being all about him and him alone. So we need to be constantly turning our focus back to God. But the beautiful thing is that he gives grace. You know, and, and I look around and I see you guys, and I look into my own life and I see me. And we all know that we are messed up, that we have messed up that we have focused on other things and found our value in other things and chose to, uh, you know, set God on the back burner so that we could focus on other things, I guarantee that we can all say that about ourselves. And it's sad. But what's incredible is that God accepts us back. That he doesn't say, no, you've messed up one too many times. No, you've turned away or you're too far away or you've left me behind and so I don't care about you anymore. That's not the God that we serve. That's not the God that we love. That's not the God who gave up his life for you. He says, I want you no matter what, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've struggled with, no matter how you've screwed it up, I want to be with you. And Jesus tells this story in, in Luke 15, and, and he tells a story because some people come up to him and they say, what is wrong with this dude? Jesus, you keep eating with these sinners. You keep hanging out with these people who are messed up. You shouldn't be doing that. Aren't you a holy man? Why are you eating with sinners? And he tells this amazing story, and you guys know it. It's called the, the prodigal son or the lost son, where a father has a couple kids, and, and one of the sons says, 
I'm out of here, Dad, you know, give me my inheritance. I want to do what I want to do. And he goes and he, he spends himself. He spends all that he has. He spends his life and his money and his passions on what the Bible calls wild living. And he, he's, he lets his focus go on to things that, that don't matter and, and are just a waste. And ultimately, he comes up empty. He spends it all. He goes all out for the things of this world, and he comes up empty. And he ends up in a terrible position. He ends up in the worst position possible, where he is uh, essentially uh, lower on the, on the totem pole than even pigs. And so he says, man, I, I have no hope, and so I need to, to you know, go and grovel and beg and ask, ask my dad if he'll let me be one of his slaves. And so he turns back home. And what the Bible says is that his father saw him way off and he went and got him. Now, it is so awesome that you and me have been there. And God says, Turn around. Set your focus on me. Come back home. And I, I will see you way off. And what the Bible says is the father went running after him, threw his arms around him and said, we are going to have a party because my son was lost and he's home. It's awesome. And you guys are looking at me and I know I'm like a lady up here. But... Can I tell you that I can't help it? And it's not because I'm an emotional wreck of a person. I don't watch Nicholas Sparks movies. <laughs> but there is one thing that means more than anything. And that is our God and his love for us. Don't waste yourself on other things. Don't be afraid that you can't come back home. Don't be afraid that God's not going to run after you. Because he does, and he will. And it's going to be a party. Because your God was focused on you, whether you were focused on him or not. And that's the gospel. And it's so good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you that you see us absolutely for who we are. And that you love us. And God, I just pray for all of us in the room today, but especially these campers. God, I ask that, uh, that they would see your love and your greatness and your glory and the ultimate reward of being with you forever and having new life in you. And understand that that is so much better than any of the fleeting beauty, weak passions, or fake satisfaction that this world has to offer. And God, I pray that we would leave those things behind. And that we would turn to you. Because we know that your love for us never fails. And that because we are your sons and daughters, when we turn back to you, even when we are a far way away, you run to us. God, the gospel is absolutely such good news. And we want to live in response to it. Help us not to waste ourselves on the things of this world but to live for you and for you alone. And it's in your name that we pray.
Amen.